Welcome. It's great to see you. Um, so uh, Marion Wrighthouse has just published a new interpretation of the history of women's suffrage. It is um, entitled Votes for Women, the American Woman's Suffrage Movement and the 19th Amendment. Um, it has been reviewed um, by the American Library Association book list um, uh, with, this is a great description, quote, an engaging warts and all approach to the broad range of historical figures that made this mass movement. I'll mention here that the book is one in a series of guides to historic events in America, edited by Randall Miller, um, and Randall Miller and Marion Roydhouse are both past presidents of the Pennsylvania Historical Association. In Marion's hard-pressed memory, she has been attending PHA conferences since the early 1980s. Marion has also written on women in Pennsylvania, on workers' education, and Southern women's history. She is um, Emerita Dean of Liberal Arts and Professor of History and founding director of the Center for Teaching Innovation and Nexus Learning at Thomas Jefferson University. Again, the Q&A is open. I am going to attempt to gather your questions and your comments um, after Marion's presentation. Um, Marion, uh, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, thank you everybody. I am really delighted to be here today despite the weather and my uh, machines which never fail me except when obviously it's important. Um, it's, it's part of the process of us getting to you know Zoom I think. I, I'm honoured to be here actually because the, this topic, this, the, the issues of democracy, of universal suffrage are so important to us today and I think it is so wonderful that on this October we are looking at the consequences of the 19th Amendment and the what made the suffrage movement work, what made it pass in 1920 and what that means for us as historians and scholars as well as citizens of this democracy. And I know the papers that are coming are, are going to explain perfectly well more about how Pennsylvania fits in and how and these question, general questions of democracy. So I'm looking forward to the rest of the day and may you all find out that all your machines are not working before you begin, unlike me. So we know uh, really too little about Pennsylvania and uh, women's suffrage. And that's one of the things that makes this event uh, really so important. So I see my job today is to give you a little snapshot of both uh, the present in terms of the women's political position in the nation and in Pennsylvania, and then to give you something of the problems with the historical version of how women uh, won suffrage and how women have progressed in this question of the historical origins of women's um, access to political power. I mean, the question of universal suffrage and the question of access to political power and the role of women in the formal political system is obviously relevant as we face this election year. In theory, the electorate was doubled in 1920, but we know that that's not so, and that who votes is still a very much contested question. In a world where voter restriction of efforts are still happening, where there's a limited number of male drop-in boxes, there's limited polling places, there's gerrymandered districts, voter ID restrictions and all the other efforts to tamp down who actually votes. So women are still scarce in this congressional chambers of power. As the 2020 presidential elections come along, um, the United States Senate has only 26 women and the 102 elected to the House of Representatives in 2018 comprise less than 24% of that body, which is fairly um, astonishing. I'm going to um, 
share the um, screen a little bit so that you can see um, the current, I'll come back to this, the, the current set of um, women in, in Congress, a cheery uh, group of women, but a reminder that those women are still a minority. Even though women first arrived in Congress in 1916, before the passage of the 20th, 19th Amendment, um, Jean Rank, Jeanette Rankin from Montana, it's only since the 1990s that women have represented a sizable proportion of the leadership or the leadership in the leadership, a reality that reflects in part the fact that since the 1980s, women voters began to outnumber men. Nearly two thirds of the 325 women elected to the House since 1916 arrived after 1992, and nearly half of those after 1998. I'm reading that out because um, I think it's really important to understand that there is a long way to go. And of course, women's bids for office are the own, only one aspect of the story. And since the 1990s, increasingly scholarship on voting trends in uh, post-1920 has created a rather interesting story. For example, we know that despite the myth that there was going to be a huge women's party, there was going to be a block of women voting, all those suffragists were going to vote en masse. That was always a myth. Nobody thought that. Carrie Captain Chat didn't think of think it. Um, and there's plenty of others, other evidence to say that that was indeed a myth. But um, we do now know that gender does not drive voting choices. That it's true that women in the that Democratic women tend to vote for Democrats. Um, in 2016, gender did not override Republicans, women, Republican women's commitment to uh, the Republican Party. So we know now that we ought not to be looking for this women's block, but also we don't yet quite understand the issue of the gender block. Um, so we know that there is no such thing as gender solidarity. Sol so, <laughs> solidarity, that race, class, ethnicity, religion, all these things divide women as they divide men. So let's move back to our own state, <clears throat> how women won the vote in Pennsylvania. I'm going to give you a short and nasty summary, which will be expanded during the rest of the day. But the fight in Pennsylvania was like in other states, and particularly on the East Coast, very long and very hard. So Pennsylvania began as a leader of the women's rights movement before the Civil War. It began as the leader in abolition. It had the one successful interracial women's abolition and women's rights um, society in Pennsylvania. And former abolitionists created the Pennsylvania Women's Suffrage Association in 1869, as the suffrage movement split in its first grand schism. But after 1869, we really don't hear anything about that suffrage movement. We don't know enough about that suffrage movement until 1910. In 1910, the movement rejuvenated, uh, new women were added, people grew more interested. And they finally were able to persuade the state legislature in a rare moment when the Republicans lost control and the progressives took over, they were able to persuade the legislature to hold a suffrage referendum. 1915, everybody is out working in all parts of the state, but like Massachusetts, like New Jersey, like New York, the suffrage amendment went down to failure. In Pennsylvania, it's particularly interesting to me because suffrage lost in Philadelphia, and it lost because the machine politicians opposed 
women voting for a couple of reasons. One, they didn't want control, further control of industry. And two, they were afraid of women's um, attempts or that women would provoke more reform efforts. So the 55,000 votes that women lost by were lost in Philadelphia itself and in the um, heavily German areas of Lancaster County uh, where ethnic Germans didn't want um, to lose access to alcohol. Uh, the liquor question was there the main is issue and the liquor interests had spent a great deal of money. And lastly, there was a reasonably effective anti-suffrage movement in, led in uh, Lebanon County. So Pennsylvania went down in 1915 and could not hold another referendum. Um, in 1917 because of the state constitutional laws. So come 1920, they were still organized and organized effectively and were the seventh state to ratify, the first non-suffrage state to ratify. And so there was a grand celebration in Harrisburg. There was a parade, there were balloons, the women flooded the legislature. In 1923, there were eight uh, women in the legislature in 1925, um, Flora Vare of the powerful Philadelphia machine, political machine family, uh, went to the state senate. <clears throat> but there were purportings, Cornelia of the future, Cornelia Bryce Pinchot, who was married to Gifford Pinchot, pres a preservationist, conservationist, was a particularly active and enthusiastic politician. She'd grown up listening to Theodore Roosevelt, learning from his uh, expertise and she ran for Congress and she ran for governor after the death of her husband. She didn't win at any point. And this is, was a signal that in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, it was going to be a long struggle after 1920. And it's still so in 2020. Pennsylvania in 2016 ranked 40th in terms of the representation of women in its state legislature. So this is a fact I did not know until a couple of months ago, and I must say it's, it surprised me, it probably shouldn't have. As of 2020, there were only 52 women among the 203 representatives in Pennsylvania State House, and only 13 women of the state's 50, in the state's 50 person Senate. So Pennsylvania ranks 31 in the number of now ranks at 31. Four of Pennsylvania's 18 representatives um, in the House of Representatives are women in 2020. But another interesting statistic on this from the Rutgers Center for Women in Politics and the Center at Chatham University in Pittsburgh is that um, Pennsylvania ranks 46th in overall gender parity in the measures that include economic security, political participation, education, health, and work. So these are the kinds of things that I think are worth exploring. And I know that there will be, if not now, later, plenty of scholars in Pennsylvania and uh, up and down the East Coast who are interested in all of these issues. We don't know enough about the suffrage movement itself. and We also don't know enough about women in politics since 1920. Um, I'm going to give in the, in, a, in the time, within the time limits, I'm going to now give you a little um, glimpse into the questions raised by the passage of the 19th Amendment itself, um, given the background of what we know today. The 19th Amendment was to double the electorate. It was supposed, supposed to bring in for women access to political power, access to political positions. And although the 19th Amendment was indeed an enormous achievement after seven plus decades of struggle, and it, its passage did mark a significant shift in women's ability to use the ballot box uh, to change things, it didn't enfranchise all women. 
Now, some women had been voting since 1870. There were women in, in several states, many states actually by 1919, who were already voting. So that's one thing that has been relatively ignored. But the other one is who was not enfranchised by the 19th Amendment. I mean, when Senator Bainbridge Colby, um, Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby signed the 19th Amendment, he signed it in his, in his home office early in the morning without any suffragists there because he didn't want to get into the middle of the battle between the militants and the so-called conservatives under Carrie Chapman Catt. And this continuing, this, this conflict um, between the two, two groups, one under Alice Paul, the militants, and one under Carrie Catt and um, other, not really conservative, but more quite respectable women, um, would continue after the 1920 um, divide. An estimated 95% of black women, especially in the South, uh, remain voteless until the 1965 Civil Rights Act because those women were prevented from voting, even though they turned out in great numbers in 1920. Gradually, as men had during Reconstruction, as black men had, they were removed from the voting polls by violence, by poll taxes, by literacy tests, by any means possible, by those who were determined to maintain uh, white suffrage. So black women were left behind. Um, indigenous Native Americans did not get the vote in 1920. Chinese and Mexican women, whose families had often lived in the Southwest for generations upon generations, did not get the vote. Women who'd married uh, foreigners and who had lost their citizenship, as a consequence, remained disenfranchised. And so too did women in the colonial territories uh, acquired in the Spanish-American War. So every one of those groups of women had to continue the fight um, in, well into the 50s and then into the 1960s. And of course, continuing the fight today. So the 19th Amendment did not actually end the question of women's access to political power. Rather, it was a milestone and a continuum reaching beyond 1920. And so that's one of the first uh, issues today, the 19th Amendment as a, as, a, as, as a watershed and one level, as a divide, rather than a place where we suddenly were able to say women had made it. In 1990, uh, Nancy Cott argued, I think compellingly, that it wasn't that the 19th Amendment was a milestone in the long effort towards gender equality. But it was also a marker along the path towards a liberal democracy. So here was a shift, but not the shift that many have been told or believe in terms of public memory. There never really, and Nancy Cott uh, again points this out, as I've already said, of women never really expectation that women for, would form a voting bloc. And um, this is contrary, I might say, to the, to the literature that I read and I was told in, by some of my learned professors when I reached graduate school in the early 1970s. Um, so the scholarship on women's suffrage and women's political power has changed enormously since we began writing women's history in the late 60s and it turns into a flood when it comes to the issues of women's suffrage in the 1980s and 1990s. So Cott describes this women's voting bloc as interpretive fiction requiring a willing suspension of disbelief and so although the 19th amendment uh, gave us women more dignity it not and the possibility of more power, it didn't bring it. That did not stop 
um, the efforts by male politicians. Let me get back. 1920 brings in the vote. The presidential elections happen. Women vote. They vote for Warren Harding mostly. Um, but as soon as that election is over, the commentators begin with the it, the notion that women really were not going to make any impact on the uh, voting populace, on political power, that women were simply going to vote exactly as they were told the night before, which is what George Gallup said in 1940. And a Columbia University survey at that point reported that women would go to the male member of their family to discuss politics and, theref and therefore concluded that women would defer to male political wisdom. Uh, Nancy Cop points out that this takes an enormous leap of faith that the stereotyping achieved in this classic account has really been equaled and never surpassed. Those are those words. So it's this kind of public myth that um, historians have to overcome when they want to look at the issues of the 19th Amendment. Now I'm looking at the time. Um, I'm going to finish with a little about the historiography, the story, the narrative of how women won the vote. Because here again, we meet a remarkably um, odd, in some levels, <laughs> a remarkably uh, wrong public notion of what happened, or the, the notion of what happened as it's taught in schools is in some ways so uh, wrong that we really need to work hard to rewrite that history. So like all histories, um, of course, history is shaped by the sources available and it's shaped by the people who write that history. And in this case, it was one group of historians, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who produced the massive history of women's suffrage, which was six volumes long in the end. It went from 1881 when the first volume came out to 1922 when the last one came out. It was 6,000 words, contained all sorts of bits and pieces from women in um, uh, suffrage groups all over the country. It contained a grand narrative written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and in which she was the main heroine and in which she and Anthony led the fight from beginning to end. Um, in this fight, the uh, women gathered in, 19, in 1848 in Seneca Falls and with Elizabeth Cady Stanton's leadership and many of the histories now include Susan B. Anthony in that gathering in Seneca Falls, which she wasn't there and uh, she didn't meet Stanton until 1851. But the, the, uh, the gathering in Seneca Falls in 1848, which with the Declaration of Sentiments declared for, the, for women's suffrage, uh, Stanton overcame the opposition of the audience with Franklin, with Frederick Douglass supporting her, and the suffrage movement began. Once the suffrage movement began, women from uh, mostly the Northeast, white, Protestant, middle and upper class women, um, began to fight not just for women's rights, but also for suffrage. After the Civil War and the enormous um, uh, slap in the face that the 14th and 15th Amendment represented to Katie Stanton and Anthony, when black men were uh, granted suffrage, but women were not, Stanton and Anthony formed a really women's only group, the National Women Suffrage Association, and they went ahead to fight for suffrage against the, the, the attacks of men from all over the country. Most of this work was done on the East Coast and Susan B. Anthony led this uh, crusade 
well into the 1900s until she died in 1906. And then according to the general myth, um, along came Alice Paul in 1910, or the general story, I should say. Alice Paul rode in to stir things up and to enliven the movement, to bring it back from the doldrums and the um, pathetic efforts, as she would have said, of the uh, respectable suffrage women. And Alice Paul and her militants made the difference and won the day uh, against the efforts of Carrie Chapman Catt and her conservative National American Women's Suffrage Association. So that's the quick story of women's suffrage. In fact, this version uh, is a result of the use of the history of women's suffrage as the main resource by historians who are writing about women's suffrage after the death of the first generation, those women who were in the fight. Um, from Eleanor Flexner on with her well-written and wonderful book, Century of Struggle, 1959, uh, then Aileen Craditor uh, soon after talking about the intellectual issues, um, histories of women's suffrage from then on used the history of women's suffrage, the, the resources of Stanton Anthony version to write women's suffrage history. And the problem with that was that the Stanton Anthony version was from the beginning an origins myth, as Lisa Tetrod has, has so aptly examined. It was created by the two women, Stanton and Anthony, to recruit more women to the cause. It was historical activism. Uh, it was intended as a, as a message and it worked very well. It brought, brought women into the movement, but those women and the historians who relied upon it didn't understand what was left out. So if we look at the reality of the history of women's suffrage, the grand narrative, you can see from the beginning, there's no mention, virtually no mention of Lucy Stone and the American women's suffrage movement, which was a suffrage association, which was actually the bigger association, the one that worked across the country, the one that worked with women in the West, um, the one that worked state by state or plodding on when federal efforts failed and when Stanton and Anthony were mired in um, political and social uh, con controversy. So Lucy Stone does not appear because by the time 1880 comes around and, and, and Elizabeth Cat Stanton's writing the history, Stone and Anthony have become mortal enemies. Uh, Lucy Stone refuses to contribute to the, to the compilation and in doing so, she basically writes herself out of history. Harriet Stanton Blatch, uh, Elizabeth's daughter, uh, sees the fact that there's nothing about uh, Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell, Julia Ward Howe. Um, there's nothing about them in the history and she uh, writes a chapter. Um, she writes it without the help of, of Lucy Stone, but that chapter, that's the only chapter that deals with more than half of the suffrage movement. That, um, in, that disappearance has continued in many suffrage histories um, to, into this day. Um, African-Americans are ignored in this struggle. Uh, women who fought with Susan Anthony or got on the wrong side of Susan Anthony disappear. Matilda, Jocelyn, Gage, who helped write the first volumes, um, became too, uh, too radical. When she wrote a book on the church and the state and women, that was regarded as um, far too radical for the National Women's Suffrage Association, and Susan Anthony pretty much made sure that she was removed from any positions of power. The same for another uh, person, Lily, Joss, Lily Devereux Blake. Um, none of the internal uh, conflicts appear in the history of women's suffrage. There are no arguments. Um, the, some things that reflect badly upon the suffrage movement or Anthony 
things like the support of George Train, a glorious flamboyant, fem, flamboyant <laughs> racist um, who, uh, who they asked to campaign with them in Kansas. Um, Victoria Woodhull, who exploded um, the New York Society with her information that Henry Beecher Stowe, the great, uh, the great um, preacher, uh, was having an affair with one of his, uh, his congregation. That does not appear because that actually blew up the um, National Women's Suffrage Association, lost it members, its members and set back the suffrage movement. So in general, um, we can say that there's lots missing. And one last thing, two more actually, but quickly. The other thing that's missing is any mention of money and the need of it. And it's only huge amounts of money put in by wealthy women after 1890. Um, to Anna Howard Shaw and then to Carrie Catt. Mrs. Frank Leslie gives uh, two million. Um, uh, uh, Mary Burnham, who is an heir to the um, uh, railroad, Baldwin Engineering Works in Philadelphia, um, bankrolls Alice Paul. Um, Alva Belmont, my favorite, Alva Smith Vanderbilt Belmont who divorced her husband for flouting his mistress in Paris by um, setting her up in a house in Paris with footmen, footmen dressed in livery. She divorces him. She's thrown out of New York society. She marries Oliver Belmont, another, bank, another wealthy man, a banker. And then when he dies, she's left with an enormous fortune, which she puts at the feet of the suffrage movement. Of course, she wants to control that suffrage movement. And so the whole issue of coercive philanthropy is, has been uh, mostly ignored. It was certainly ignored by the suffragists. They didn't want to mention money. The other one, and one of my favorites, is the Men's Suffrage League. Um, the Men's Suffrage League in, uh, begun in New York by Oswald uh, Garrison Villard. In other words, a descendant, a grand, the grandson of William Lloyd Garrison, the, and the son of an abolitionist and a suffragist, uh, calls for the founding, sets up the founding of a men's suffrage league where men of enormous power, enormous privilege, um, join ranks, walk down Fifth Avenue in 1911, and are uh, hissed and booed and uh, a cat called and called her Aunt Nancy men all the way down. It doesn't stop from 60th down to Washington Square. Um, these men become enormously helpful in access to Senate legislatures or to state legislatures. So all of these issues are ones that have not yet been looked at sufficiently and um, have been uh, revealed by historians in the last uh, 20 years, but leave a great deal to be um, investigated by uh, those who want to investigate po politics, democracy, universal suffrage, and the doubling of the electorate. Well, that I should stop because we have a 10 minutes, um, I think, <laughs> Four questions, Rachel. Marian, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you brought up men's the men's suffrage league. That was that was part of that was one of the um, topics that I wanted to ask you about. What what I am hearing from um, your address is how much more work we need as historians to do, how many more questions we need to ask, and perhaps also, you know, this emphasis that we really need to think about in terms of the diversity of participants in the struggle for suffrage. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going yeah. to invite uh, our uh, audience, uh, over 90 folks are joining us. Um, I'm going to invite our audience to, again, use the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen to pose a question 
but it's a good that that is a good place to start because if you um, believe the sort of the current public version, it was middle and upper class white Protestant women. But if you look at California in 1910, if, actually, if you look at Washington at the same time, what, 1910, California in 1911, and then New York um, in 1915, uh, you will see that there's an enormous range of coalitions and their political coalitions, um, which Stan, uh, Anthony uh, did not want to indulge in. She uh, managed to overthrow or get rid of anybody who wanted to consider political coalitions. But so labor, labor women, Labor, uh, laboring women came into the mix um, in all those three states, just as examples. In New York City, um, the uprising of the 20,000, the textile strikes of 1909, um, were key to the success in 1917 because the Women's Trade Union League had um, been unable to get men trained, male trained trade unionists to really support their efforts. Um, the allies, those middle and upper class women who were committed to uh, improving the conditions of work and wages and uh, the lives of working women. So the WTUL turned to suffrage, to recruiting working women for suffrage. And when the strikes um, took place in 1909, those women were down there at night court bailing out uh, strikers who were being uh, arrested for um, vagrancy or for being prostitutes because picketing was legal. And so they couldn't be arrested for picketing, but they could be arrested for anything else that was dreamed up. And so Alba Belmont paid people's bail. Um, Carola Weirschoffer, uh, I've, I've got her name wrong, but she put up $75,000 in bail money um, she was an heiress who worked in the settlement house and did an investigation of labor uh, uh, conditions. Um, so uh, labor is one. There are Jewish women led by Maud Nathan, uh, 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 who's um, a descendant of German Jews, who went down into the Lower East Side and acted as a translator for those Eastern European Jews who then moved into the movement. So. Um, it's only recently that, that there's been a book on, on, the, on Jewish women's activist, activism and suffrage. Um, there were black women uh, organizing in Brooklyn, in, in, in New York, who were, who were involved. There were the Men's League, the ones I love the most, those who, who were bankers, who were stockbrokers. You know, the person who, who founded what became Standard & Poor was the one who, who rode with his wife out west in a car, drove out west, traveled around um, re, uh, recruiting for suffrage, came back home again. Uh, Maud Nathan and her husband went upstate New York. I'll stop. Um, I get pretty entertained by people. Um, we have, we have um, several other questions that I'd like sorry. to pose in our, our last few minutes, but once again, um, I think there's just a fertile ground within Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic and local communities that we need to do so much more research. Um, yeah, because the same things are happening. So um, this is an interesting question. Um, uh, posed by uh, Alan Dietrich Ward. Um, suffrage and public history, what monuments should there be? Um, you can see that that's, you know, in Central Park, the whole fight over who should be in the Central Park monument, you know, started off with Anthony and Stanton. And I do not like Susan Anthony. Uh, this, uh, I'll make that clear. Uh, they added Sojourner Truth. I mean, in Pennsylvania, the, the way is wide open. You know, there's no, I mean, this is Frederick Douglass, 
does not appear in Central Park either. You know, I mean, it's not just those obvious um, uh, women leading the movement. Um, Pennsylvania, I mean, Cornelia Pinchot, Myra Lloyd Dock, the preservationist, um, there were um, um, women like Jenny Roessing from Pittsburgh and Philadelphia because Alice Paul managed to, to divide the Pennsylvania suffrage movement. So uh, we don't yet know enough. Um, now, Christina LaRocco at the Historical Society has done a wonderful job of finding Pennsylvania suffragists you know, as a part of the biographical dictionary that uh, Kitty Skla and um, uh, began at SUNY. Um, we don't know yet enough, it seems to me. I mean, that's a really good question, Ellen. We know, don't know enough about uh, who should, you know, about Pennsylvania suffragists, but why not? Why isn't there a plaque for Anna Howard Shaw at her house in uh, near Swarthmore, Rose Valley? You know, um, uh, these people, Frances Watkins Harper was in, the black suffragist and journalist was in Pennsylvania, but, uh, working for the WCTU. I mean, there's lots of people. Um, a comment uh, made by Kurt Miner uh, is that Pennsylvania would seem to have made a strong effort to appeal to factory women. Uh, Rose Winslow, yeah. uh, uh, a National Women's Party member, daughter of Polish immigrants, worked in, worked in textile factories across Pennsylvania, and maybe New York. Mm -hmm. um, I, Kurt here is emphasizing, Marion, you have already emphasized um, how we uh, uh, might consider working class women um, mm -hmm. as part of um, other social movements at the time, and certainly in terms of the struggle of suffrage, as well as uh, class alliances. Um, yep. Yeah, we, and yeah, um, and Kurt, thanks um, because I think there's a lot of more research to be done there uh, because 1915. One of the reasons th that Pennsylvania failed was of a, a real failure to um, do enough work amongst working women and labor. I mean, labor supported the. Uh, I mean, labor did support. Um, especially um, in Scranton, there's a great tales, uh, did support the vote, but they hadn't done enough um, campaigning in, for rural women and, and, and labor across the um, state enough. Um, so yeah, Rose Winslow certainly there. And then there's a shirtwaist strike and uh, there's organization. So I think that's more to be known. Yeah. Um, at the at the top of this session, I had welcomed our undergraduate students, our graduate students that once again, I think there are some wonderful papers, some wonderful research yeah. projects uh, on so many topics, right, that you've uh, been telling us about. Um, we uh, are really um, uh, at the end of our session, um, I'm r realizing that we need to go to our first panel. Um, so Marion, I, I thank you so, so much. Um, I'm gonna capture these questions and send them to you, yes. uh, those that we didn't answer. But yes. again, I appreciate this. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Bye everyone.